three kings into the east, three kings both great and high, and they have sworn a solemn oath, John Barleycorn must die. They took a plough and ploughed him down, and put clods on his head. Born of solemn oath, John Barleycorn was dead. The cheerful spring came kindly on, and showers began to fall. John Barleycorn got up again. And so surprised them all. The sultry suns of summer came, and he grew thick and strong. His head we armed with pointed spears that no one should do him wrong. Sober autumn entered mild, and he grew wan and pale. His bending joints and drooping head showed he began to fail. His colour sickened more and more. He faded into age, and then his enemies began to show. Like a rogue in forgery They laid him out upon his back And cudgelled him full sore And hung him out before the storm And tossed him over and over They filled up a darksome pit And filled it to the brim and he then, John Barleycorn, they let him sink or swim. They laid him out upon the floor to work him father woe. And still the signs of life appeared, they turned him more and more. They wasted o'er a scorching flame. But he crushed him between two stones And he had taken his very hero blood And drank him round and round And still the more and more they drank Their joy did more abound
Wer fahr ja orest sonsi face? Great chieftain of the pudding race. Aboon them all, you tack your place, pinch tripe or theorem. Weel are you worthy o' a grace, as lang's my erem. The groaning trencher there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill. Your pin war helped him in the mill in time and eat, while through your pores the dews distill like amber beat. His knife, see your rustic labour dicht, and cut you up with ready slicht, trenching your gushing entrails bricked like Honey Ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sight! Warm, reeking, rich. There's another five verses of this, which you're all very aware of because you've got a copy of it in your box. Now, I'm 95% convinced that none of you have any idea what I'm talking about, apart from my brother, Up in Sky. How's it going, Donny? Brilliant work, by the way, on the tune. So, cut a long story short, here's my haggis. I'm going to address it, oh, before it falls off the plate. You're pure dead brilliant, by the way, okay? Now, let's drink some whiskey. Hi, welcome to Stir Crazy, I'm Patrick Fogarty and it's our Burns Night special. I would like to say massive, massive thank you to Donald Livingston for that awesome rendition of John Barleycorn. So John Barleycorn is a poem and song that was written by uh, the fabulous Bard to uh, basically celebrate whiskey. It's all about whiskey production. And so my uh, brother-in-law Donald is on the Isle of Sky. He's a a really renowned folk musician, as you can tell, brilliant singer, brilliant musician, so really good to see him, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for that again, and there's a bit more from him later. Um, that was, as I said, John Barleycorn, and also massive thanks to that abbreviated version of uh, Ode to a Haggis. I, <laughs> I love the ending on that, so yeah, no, really, really good. Thank you uh, to my lovely wife, who is also a Ouija Glaswegian from... Uh, the uh, Scotland and uh, yeah she's a bit of a highlander we found out so uh, we'll talk a bit more about those regions as well later on um, so yeah this is all about the fabulous uh, Robert Burns or Rabbi Burns um, I'm not going to try my Scottish accent because every time I do I get absolutely ruined for it especially from her indoors um, so yeah he was a, a Scottish poet he was uh, really renowned for writing in the Scots language, probably the most famous one who wrote in the Scots language. He did a lot in English as well, and he did some really awesome poems. He did To a Mouse, which is one of my favourite. We did a drink on that in our fourth journal, and it's a beautiful poem all about uh, a wee sleek at Timorous Beastie. And um, so, yeah, it's this, uh, he got this real sort of way with words, and we, we sing his uh, songs every year because Old Lang Syne, was rewritten by him from a folk song in Scotland. Um, and then also at the end we'll have Now Westling Wind, uh, which is a, another song which my brother-in-law has sung, which is absolutely beautiful with him on the guitar. So yeah, thanks again for them for that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna jump straight in and just say uh, the box contents that you should have. And so you should have a lovely box this week. Uh, it's full of goodies, full of bottles, full of everything. Um, so firstly, all the little plastic bottles are recyclable, so you can recycle those. Um, it's very hard to send these up without that, and you've got little drams of, uh, there's about 15, 20 mil of each whiskey in there. So there's quite a bit of whiskey here. If you're not used to drinking, and that's probably complete nonsense, it's lockdown, so everyone's used to drinking. So, uh, But if you're not, um, it's quite a bit of spirits, so have some water ready as well. Uh, we will definitely need some water for when we're tasting. It's part of the tasting experience is to add in a little bit of water and it's also why we have this little pipette as well so in your box you'll have a little pipette um, if you can take a glass of water uh, both for drinking and for also adding in drops of uh, water to our whiskies as a second taste each time so that goes in the water like that so and also have some extra water just on the side just to keep you rehydrated and so too if you need to refresh your palate because some of these are quite strong flavors um, we've, we've done them up very nicely you've got bottles one through six and you've got, should have uh, three pieces of paper in there as well. And so on one side of it, you will have, uh, you'll have your lovely sheet, which will have a map of Scotland uh, and the full address to the haggis, not the abbreviated version. So um, as you can see, even just trying to read this is giving me a headache. Um, and my wife is Glaswegian and she finds it hard enough to pronounce uh, all of those as well. She's done it in full before, 
uh, as an address to the Haggis as well, a full event for Burns Night. Um, but yeah, so we're quite lucky. We had the abbreviated version, and I'm having Haggis, Neeps, and Tatties later. Um, and so one of the things I would say is get a Haggis, Neeps, and Tatties. It's Burns Night. Uh, Neeps and Tatties, turn up some potatoes, basically chopped up, all done together, and you've got that lovely Haggis. Uh, and they do do vegan ones and vegetarian ones as well. And it's just, I particularly like haggis, much to uh, the shock of my uh, in-laws in Scotland. Um, I really love it. I love the peppery flavour of it. I love that sweet and all that uh, offal flavours and everything else. It's absolutely delicious. Um, and uh, some people think it's acquired taste. I love it. Um, but yeah, on there you'll also see we've got a map of Scotland there as well. And on there there are five different regions. We have Speyside, we have Highlands, Lowlands, Campbelltown, Islay. Um, you will see the islands there, but they really are, although they are separate, they are considered part of the highlands as well. So any of the whiskies from the islands would generally say island on it as well. But I'll get to all of those later. The other one you'll have as well is a little cheat and what's in the box on the back of that, so you can see all that as well. Um, when we do the tasting, uh, if you have the map out, then I can explain that to you as well. The second sheet, which I've got in front of me here with all my glasses on, is my tasting sheet. And so on there you have uh, numbers one to six uh, that coincide with bottles one to six. It's that easy, really, really simple. Um, and so very, very easy for you to figure out which goes in which. Have six glasses in front of you because you want to be able to taste these whiskies and go back to them. And you don't want to drink it all, you want a tiny amount in the mouth each time just to taste it and sip it and savour it. And then you can go back and compare them and you can see how the differences are because the first time you taste something will com be completely different to the second or third time. So, uh, and when you've had quite a few of the whiskies, you'll go back and taste the early ones and they'll seem uh, even softer and smoother or they'll have rich, more toffee notes and things like that. And you'll pick more out of it. So it's quite good to go back to them as well. And so uh, what you can do is, uh, in a second, you can set those all up and just pour all your bottles into the corresponding numbers on your sheet. Underneath each of those there, you've got a nice little flavour wheel. And this gives you a hint of what you're looking for in flavours. So it might say, like Cardu, it'll say sweetness with fruity uh, floral notes with body and malty uh, textures. But it won't have any of that peaty smokiness that's got uh, in some of the other ones. So it gives you an idea where the flavours are leaning to on that type of, uh, on those whiskies. So it really helps out with that as well. And when I talk about it, you'll know what I'm trying to go for as well. Um, so yeah, so we've done that. So it's nice and easy for you to do. So those are your first uh, ones there. But before we get to that, what I want to do is I want to make a cocktail for you. And I think that's really important as well. So we've got a drink to go because uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of whiskey style. And so while I do that, we'll talk about those cocktails. So what else is in the box? You should have a pouch. So pouch there, but it's third crazy sticker on it. So we're going to use that in our first cocktail. And for it, what we want is a highball or a tall glass for that. You can use a flute, but I would rather use a highball for that. The other glass we're going to need is a martini glass or a small wine glass, something like that. Um, this is for our flip later on, our Burns flip. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to put that in the freezer and it's going to get nice and chilled and frosted so that when I come to coat it later with all those lovely crumbs of shortbread which we're going to use, so don't eat the shortbread yet because um, we're going to use that to garnish the edge of this glass. Um, I'm going to pop that in the freezer so I'm going to hand that off to my lovely wife Dee who's off stage here um, and uh, she's going to uh, pop that in the freezer for me and then get that out for me later when I uh, need it. Next thing we're going to need is some ice uh, as well. Um, other things in your box will be uh, two little unmarked bottles. Now these are for the last cocktail, these are Burns Flip. So don't get them confused with the numbered bottles because these have no numbers on them and they are for the flip at the end. Um, the other thing you'll need, you'll have your straw as well, which will be for our first drink. Um, but for our drink later, you will have uh, to, to get an egg as well. So you should have a nice uh, fresh egg there and that's for the flip because the flip really needs that egg to make it work. Um, lastly, what you should have is a bag of some Scottish shortbread. And so this is again, uh, part of it's a snack and part of it is for garnishing. So uh, keep those to one side and save those for later. Um, and obviously we'll need some ice as well. Um, for the second cocktail, we will need a cocktail shaker. If you haven't got a cocktail shaker, use a jam jar, use a um, something like a, a Nutribullet uh, can or something like that. Anything you can get a really good lid on and shake it up so you can get this all mixed up properly. Um, the only other thing you'll need is obviously a strainer or a big spoon just to hold the ice back at the end of that. Um, and then lastly, for the shortbread, you can use something like a, a cheese grater like that to grate up the shortbread really nicely. And by now, you see these really fine microplane ones. Um, if you don't have one of those, you can just crush it all up and make it like little bread crumbs. Um, just watch your fingers when you're doing that, obviously. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much all you need. And then the last thing we need is the soda water there as well. So 
for our first drink, it's really simple. It's a ready to drink pretty much. So what we've done is we've combined in here one of my uh, one of my favorite blended whiskies. And this blended whiskey is uh, Johnny Walker Black Lady. And um, so anyone who's done one of our masterclasses before, and especially whiskey ones, they'll know that I love Johnny Walker. I've talked about it at length. I don't really need to go into it too much. Other than say, it's got 40 different whiskies in. And one of them is that is from that distillery, Cardi. So we'll be talking a little bit about that later on anyhow. So, but Johnny Walker, Black Label in there. And then the other thing we've got is a Bassazar um, Rose Vermouth. And so what we've done is with this cocktail, it's really, really easy. So this is one we're going to drink first before we get to our whiskey tasting. And the reason being is just to have a drink while I explain a little bit about the history of whiskey first. Um, so what I want you to do is just take your pouch and pop some ice in your glass first. So pop that in there and then just pour that over my ice. It's this simple. It's really, really easy cocktail, this one. And then all I'm going to do is take my little can of Falkington soda and I'm just going to top that up and give it a really good stir. And uh, so I've got a stirring spoon. If you don't want to use a stirring spoon, you can use a chopstick. Works just as well. That's got a straw in it. But I can use a chopstick uh, and that will mix all of those ingredients up beautifully. Now what we've got in here is a uh, passion fruit and yuzu cordial. Uh, as well as that Johnny Walker Black Label and that Rosé Vermouth. And so what I want to do is I really want to play with a cocktail which is called the Bobby Burns. So it's actually named after the bard himself, uh, the Scottish bard. And so the original one would have, uh, for instance, a uh, Diwa's 12-year-old blended uh, uh, whiskey and it would have a sweet vermouth, a red vermouth, and it would have Benedictine. And it's kind of a martini drink, but I wanted a long drink to really refresh us to start with. Um, and I wanted something that was uh, really going to give lots of tropical flavors as well. It's really about, this one I've called Highland Tropics, and it's that kind of lovely flavor. And I really discovered that passion fruit goes so well with uh, Scotch whiskey, and it just really pops on the palate. And the yuzu there is give a little bit of a citrus note, that oriental citrus note. So it's got these really tropical flavors in this acid adjusted uh, passion fruit cordial. So cheers guys, uh, here's the bonus night. Mm. And you'll really get that tropical flavor, but you'll get the whiskey undercutting on it as well. And that spiciness from the Johnny Walker and pepperiness is there. And it's just, yeah, layers on through. And that rose vermouth gives layers and layers of flavor on that as well. And so. There's our first drink, and I hope you like that. So again with that, it's just literally the pouch, pouch contents into a glass, over ice, and top with soda. It's that simple. It's, it's a super, super simple acid-adjusted cocktail for you. And so we do these ready-to-drink cocktails quite a bit now in our, in our masterclasses as one of the extra drinks. And so this one is just a nice, easy one to get us going. I'm going to talk to you a bit about whiskey, but before I get there, we're just going to prep for when we do the Scotch whiskey tasting. So what I want you to do is just take all of your bottles, so one through six, and just pop them in your glass. And I'm just gonna pour them out from each of these, which is if I go front to left. So the first one we have obviously is a bit of uh, Chivas Regal, 12 year old. So that will be one of your whiskies. We then have Cardew Gold Reserve. Um, and that's our number two whiskey. We then have our Ockentoshan, which is our number three bottle of whiskey. I'm putting a similar amount to what you've got in your bottles there as well. So it's, uh, although I've got bottles in front of me, uh, obviously those ones are for when my wife does the tasting, they stir and she will love to do it. So my next one is, sorry, Ardmore, which is my Highland. Then we're going Glen Scotia, which is Campbelltown. And lastly, Fomor, which is Islay. And so uh, if you can empty all of your bottles into your glasses like that, so you've all got little measures of those in there, uh, that will be absolutely fantastic. And so, yeah, so we've got our drinks, we've got set up for our whiskey tasting, and we're all pretty much good to go. So hopefully you should have some water as well to one side for that as well. Um, <clears throat> so where am I? Um, so scotch, what is it? Um, so scotch whiskey, it's sort of essentially it's water, cereal and yeast. 
it's distilled to a maximum of 94.8% ABV when it's gone through its distillation. Um, it has to be aged for a minimum of three years to be called scotch. Um, it's basically made with barley um, and it's either peated or unpeated in the drying. And so what I mean by peated, we'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about this later, but it's about when we're drying off those barley uh, uh, sort of grains and whatnot, the actual, uh, the malted barley, what we're doing is they can either use, use different methods to dry it off and heat it. And one of those in Scotland is peat, and it's that peat that gives a really rich, smoky, peaty flavor. And so that is one of them. Um, it generally has a minimum of two distillations. There are a couple with three. We've got one today um, that has a three distillation process. And so it usually has two distillations. And then generally it uses a, uh, a cask. So when we talk about wooden casks, it's been in a wooden cask. Uh, this is a little miniature one here, you can see. And so these are made by Coopers in Scotland. They're big, big things. And they fill them up through the top and then they tap them, seal them, and then they let the uh, whiskey age in there for years and years and years and years. And then what they will do is they'll take that and they will, uh, after a minimum of three years, you've got Scotch whiskey. And so uh, it's part of that process that they use for it. So those, those casks are generally reused casks. So it might have been a cask that's held sherry. It's quite often uh, had bourbon or rum. Uh, so they, they're now playing around a lot more with the cask and what they put in them and what they reuse. And so, but it can be reused again as well on several occasions. Um, if you go to America and you have bourbon, they use the cask only once. Uh, so to have bourbon, you can't have a cask reused to be called bourbon in America. But in Scotland, they quite often take those second-hand bourbon cask after they've been used once and then they rechar them, the inside gets all charred with the wood and that releases all these lovely wood, vanillin and uh, sort of caramel flavours and uh, uh, lovely tobacco and chocolate flavours and all these different uh, complexities that they get within the barrel ageing process of it. And so yeah, that's pretty much it. And so uh, they're then generally uh, you have two different types, we have blended uh, scotch and you have single malt scotch. So all of these ones in front of me, bar that one, is a single malt. This one is blended and so is the Johnny Walker that I used in your cocktail that is blended. So this is blended from 40 different malts all over Scotland, including Cardew. Um, this one is a uh, blend of three different malts all from around Scotland and so I'll get to a little bit about that in a minute. But yeah, so <coughs> with the uh, Single malts, it's basically the distillations are done from one single distillery. So everything from the Ardmore is from the Ardmore distillery. Everything from uh, Glen Scotia is from the Glen Scotia distillery. And that is a single malt, single thing, but it could be from lots of different barrels within that distillery, but just from that distillery. So they will take barrels to make it and balance it and get all the different types of flavours into there. And they'll have different ages, but the minimum will be three years to be called a Scotch whisky. A lot of them might have longer age statements on that, or they'll have a statement on a bottle. If you have a statement like 12 years or 10 years, that is the minimum age of that whiskey, of any of the uh, bottles, uh, casks of whiskey that are in that bottle. So uh, when we have a single malt as well, uh, it's distilled twice in a copper pot still, and most of them distilled to about 65 to 75%. And this means it carries as much flavor uh, across as possible uh, to in, to be barreled up on that uh, distillation. So for those of you who don't know about distillation, it essentially you're putting it in a big kettle with this type of uh, barley beer and you're uh, literally heating it up so the alcohol comes off first and you capture that alcohol and that becomes your neat spirit, your whiskey grains, plain grain spirit, and that will then go into barrels. And so that is an idiot's guide to distillation. It's that, it is that simple, but it is not. It's that shape of the still type of still. Lots of other things as well, and we'll get onto that a little bit in a second. Um, so, where does the word whiskey come from? It comes originally from, uh, uh, came across from Ireland originally, and there is this, obviously the Scots dispute this, but it's thought to come across from Ireland and the Irish famine, and it was aqua vitae, which the monks used to make. And monks used to make a uh, aqua vitae, or water of life, it meant. And so they came across. And then they uh, came across to Scotland and they uh, set up monasteries there. And then uh, you then have all the monks making these aqua vitae for uh, generation, generation, generations, and for hundreds of years. And then you have the dissolution of the monasteries. And the monasteries then uh, dissolved, the Catholic monasteries, they all got burned to the ground. 
and uh, they basically, the monks went out into the population and they took their knowledge with them and they started making whiskey in the countryside. And so uh, when you got to Scotland, you had uh, the Gaelic form of uh, aquavita, water of life. And water of life in Gaelic is Ushki Bay. And Ushki Bay, as it traveled south and as it went over the years, became whiskey. And so that's really where the name came from. And um, so, yeah, this is uh, a lovely thing about Scotch. And the first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit about the history of Scotch beyond that. And so the first tax that was introduced in Scotland was in 1644, and this led to a massive increase in illicit whisky distillery in Scotland. And there were all these battles, and there were like clans against clans, against villages against villages, all trying to buy for uh, distilling it. And smuggling became absolutely rife and standard. So if you think about prohibition, what that did to in America, that was going on for hundreds of years in Scotland, this thing. And it was just brutal. You, you can imagine the Scots out there. This is pre-kilts. This is when they would go out to battle and everything. And they would fight uh, these battles over the whiskey production. And so uh, you would have these excise men, or gauges as they were known, and the illicit stillers and them would have this massive game of cat and mouse, all trying to outdo each other. You would have uh, members of the clergy, they would be trying to hide it in their uh, pulpits and their cellars and the crypts. Uh, they were, it's been renowned, it's even been known that they were transporting it in coffins across the country as well. So it was everything to avoid paying tax. And uh, you can kind of understand why with it. And they, kind of by the 1820s, there was so much of this uh, illicit uh, distillation going on that 14, 1500 stills being confiscated every single year. 14, 1500 uh, stills a year were being confiscated. And this was only a part of it. And so more than half of the whiskey in Scotland that was consumed was basically no tax. <laughs> You've got to love the Scots for it. Um, so what's this got to do with Bobby Burns? So Bobby Burns is uh, essentially Scotland's most famous uh, tax collector. And that's what he was. He was a tax collector and in the 18th century he basically trained as an excise man and this was before he turned his attention to writing poetry and everything else but he wrote lyrically about scotch and whiskey. Uh, John Barleycorn song for instance but he also wrote Scotch Drink, An Ode to Whiskey and the Nature of Happiness, Community, Cooperation, uh, Warmth and a Friendly Welcome and it's just it's kind of the true spirit of Scotch nature and if you've ever been up to the Highlands or anywhere in Scotland you'll see that they are a really welcoming people up there and uh, I'm fortunate enough to be married to one of them so I've got to watch what I say. Um, <laughs> so yeah it was we then go on from that and uh, whiskey why did whiskey really take off why did it become a big global phenomenon and uh, it was kind of three bits of luck really with it in uh, the 1800s and first of it was obviously this excise act in 1823 and what that did was allow uh, people to pay 10 pounds and become a distiller. And so distilleries, legal distilleries, popped up all over Scotland and it started, first of all, attacking that illicit stills. Um, you then have the second bit of good news, which was an Irishman called Aeneas Coffey. We've spoken about him in the past. He created, he was another uh, exciseman, but on the Irish uh, side of the uh, water there. And uh, what he did is he created a continuous still, a column still. And what this did was allow you to continually distill product all the time and just production just got up and up and up. And it also allowed the ABV, the proof, and the quality and the purity of the spirit to become much, much better. And so you much had much higher uh, quality spirit. You had lighter grain uh, whiskies as well, which when they were blended with these fiery malts, really tamed them and created these lovely blends, which really, really took off. And it was all about blended whiskey back then. Single malts weren't really a big thing. It was, uh, they kind of existed, but they didn't really have the marketing structure of, uh, the whiskey did and so you have things like uh, Johnny Walker, Shivers Brothers, they were grocers that produced whiskey and so they would produce whiskey as, alongside teas as in the case of uh, John Walker who was a tea blender or you would have spices and herbs and luxury goods from Shivers Regal from their uh, Aberdeen shop and so uh, it was really these ones, these grocers that took off and became these big powerhouses of whiskey production for the blend. So they would take all those whiskey malts all around Scotland and make a blend out of them. So it was kind of uh, that. So that was part of it. Uh, so Aeneas Coffee and also that. But then also we have this great thing that happened, which was uh, 
it was a, a disaster to wine production across the whole of Europe, and it was the phylloxera bug. It was a little parasitic beetle that basically uh, attacked all of the vines and destroyed them. And it was brought over from the States, uh, and the British brought it over, and they basically were uh, good-hearted people at Kew Gardens, brought it over, and they it got out, and it just decimated everything in uh, the whole of Europe, and it killed production for decades of uh, brandy, particularly, as well as uh, uh, wine. And this led to, obviously, other spirits really taking cognac's place as the heart of luxury drinking in England, and whiskey bourbon in America, absinthe in France, all came up into a massive height during this time because of this one little bugger of a beetle. Um, they solved it eventually, but by that time the others had taken a massive chunk of their share uh, around the globe. And so, um, yeah, that is basically a brief history of whiskey. And then up to the present day, we kind of have all of these plethora of whiskies have arrived. And then one of the big things that kind of hit a lot of whiskey distillation in the 20th century was prohibition in America in the 1920s and 30s. And what happened there is it basically a massive market went, and as a result, so many distilleries disappeared because they just never recovered from losing that massive global market of the American market where whiskey was drunk. Um, so, yeah, that is the first bit about the history of whiskey and everything. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed your uh, Highland Tropics. And, uh, yeah, delicious. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get on to our whiskey tasting now. And so hopefully you should have six glasses in front of you all, just like me. And then what we can do is we can start going through these one at a time. So with this, as I said, for uh, you will want a little bit of water there. And it's like, after you've drunk your cocktail, clean your palate bits, you'll still have a bit of the acidity and sweetness in your palate there. And you'll just want to rinse your palate off a little bit with that as well. And so the next thing we're going to do is I'm just going to tell you a little bit how you taste whiskey. And so... It's not as easy, it's not just a question of sticking your nose in like you do with a glass of wine, taking a big inhale uh, and swirling it all around and everything like that, because the amount of alcohol in these will uh, really attack your olfactory, uh, your nose quite badly if you just stick your nose all the way in. Um, and so when we do this, we do, three, we do a few things. There's kind of five steps to it. The first step is what we do is we examine the appearance. So we look at it and we look at the color. We, we can then check out its viscosity. So the color will give you a little bit about the aging of it. Um, and uh, uh, it'll also tell you a little bit about how um, viscous it is when you swirl it around. If you swirl it around, you see how viscous, and then it will start coming down the sides of the glass. And this will tell you how viscous it is. And this gives you about the mouthfeel, a little hint about what the mouthfeel you're gonna get out of it. So the bigger the legs, the thicker, these little lines coming down your glass are, the bigger the legs, they call them, uh, the more viscous it is, and it's going to have a more voluptuous mouthfeel, a more silkier, bigger mouthfeel. And so um, so that's the viscosity part of it. Um, and then what you're going to do is uh, we're also, you can just give the glass a shake. And this is one of the ones which I don't really like to do it because it's about putting bubbles, seeing how they do, it's about how much the ABV, don't bother with that. It's not worth it. Um, but what you can do with it is if you are covering your glass and you do give it a little shake like that, you will see the little bubbles will disappear quite quickly, and I'll tell you that. But also, if you rub your hands together there, yeah. I was taught this by a rum drinker, actually, a rum distiller, and uh, he makes it around the club. And then, when you smell your hands, you really get a massive aromatic each time of those. Because it's spread over your hand, it's evaporating off, all of those aromas are coming up. That's great perfume. Um, <laughs> Smell like a smell like a Glaswegian. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm gonna get a punch for that later from the wife. So, yeah, you will uh, lovely, lovely aroma that you get on your hands there from it. And by doing that, you literally really open up the nose on that as well. So it's a really good way to smell it. And I, as I said, I learned that from a uh, rum distiller actually, and uh, they told me how how to do that. And that was one of the things he did. It was master blender at Havana Club Rum. Um, so then you've got the sniffing of it. So what you've got is you've coated the inside of your glass already when you do that. When you go in, don't stick your nose in and keep your mouth shut. Breathe through your mouth and nose at the same time. Keep it away from it a little bit because otherwise all of the alcohol is going to literally attack your nose. And, it, uh, and if you breathe through your mouth and your nose and you're circulating around this big chamber of your mouth, you're getting so much more of those aromatics in there. 
And when you're, when you're tasting spirits, this is a particularly good way to do it. And, uh, and you'll really get the subtleties there. And really, if you just pay, taste through your nose, you won't get hardly any of it. And, uh, um, so yeah, that's the second part of it as well. And, so, and then lastly, it's the first taste. You take a taste of the whiskey and you try and let it evoke memories. We all have memories attached to uh, specific smells, so like chocolate, tobacco. Uh, seaweed, salt, all of these kind of things that we have, the sea and all that kind of thing, they'll evoke memories. That's what whiskey can do to you, it can take you back somewhere. And uh, uh, so one of the great things about whiskey is that a lot of these whiskies you'll see they've got really distinct personalities when it comes to aromatics and taste. Um, then when we've done that, you can add a bit of water and try it all again. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really good way to do it. So what I'm first gonna do is move on to our very first whiskey. We've done that, we've got our cocktail out of the way. Uh, and so now we're up to the heart of it, which is tasting whiskey. And I, yeah, so here we go. Um, first whiskey we've got, it should be on number one, which is Chivas Regal 12 year old. And so we're gonna taste this first. I've already done that little shake. So if you do a little shake on your hand and you can smell that, rub it in and you'll get that lovely, lovely flavor and thing. So when you get that on your nose, you'll get a bit of vanilla, a bit of anise, lemon. There's a real toffee, butter toffee nose to it as well. And it's just like, but one of the things I always get out of this is a real banana kind of uh, nose to it. And it's got this lovely kind of literary candy banana flavor uh, nose to it as well. And so I'm just getting that loads. And this is, when you, when you smell something, you're kind of, uh, your palate goes where your nose needs it, if that makes sense. It's like, it, you're really reaffirming what your nose has already told you and uh, what's gonna be in there. It's gonna recognize those flavors because your nose has already smelled them in there. So uh, next I'm gonna go into it and have a little taste, first of all, just a little sip, not much. Don't, don't go neck the whole lot. I'm just gonna let it coat my tongue and you'll get a little bit of burn the first time you do this. And it's like, don't be afraid of that. It's part and parcel of what we're doing here. As we drink more of this, that'll soften out a bit. You'll get more and more flavors as you go through it. And the way I've put these in an order that they go in uh, order of what I would say palatability, the big, big ones at the end, the lighter, fluffier ones at the beginning, so to speak. So, uh, although none of these will be described as, <laughs> can really be described as fluffy in any way. Um, but what you'll see is by the time you get to the end, your palate will be a little bit more almost uh, attuned, if not numbed, to the alcohol burn, and so you'll be able to taste so many more flavors in it as well, as a result. But if you started the other way around, it would kind of knock your palate for six and uh, do it that. So we're building up in crescendo through those flavor profiles. And the regions will do that in their own right as well. So yeah, so what's on that palate? Palette again, I've still got a bit of banana there, but I get a really big uh, hit of barley and malt too. It's those real whiskey flavors to it. Um, it's kind of pepped up with a bit of spice um, and it's also got uh, this lovely kind of sweet toffee notes to it as well. It's like, um, and again, if I go back to it, yeah, I get a little bit of allspice in there as well. And it's that kind of spicy, spice flavor of it. A little bit of pepperiness on the palate and tongue as well. And that's kind of what I want. And it's like, it's got a really good all rounded flavor, this one. And it's got this. As a blend, what you're trying to do with blended whiskey is we're taking whiskies from all over, we're putting them together, and you're kind of, rather than just having one that hits like that, you're trying to hitting them so they all have this real mellow, smooth flavor and get all these lovely, lovely, rich flavors. And they're great for making cocktails, these, because they just are, they, they're not too punchy in one flavor, so they're not overpowering in a cocktail, and so they're really balanced, and so you get a whiskey flavor in the cocktail that you don't, have something like real big peat monsters taking over the whole drink where you can't really taste much else in there. The taste of softies. It just allows other, other products to work alongside it really, really well, whether it's citrus or whether it's uh, fruit or spice or whichever. And really good for cocktails. So that's our blended whiskey. And so, again, as I said with blended, they take blends from all over Scotland, they put them together. And if you take something like Johnny Walker, 40 different blends of malts in there, so uh, from all over Scotland. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna do, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, Go back to it, but I want you to take your pipette, put a little bit of water in it, and just pop in like two, three drops. Now all this does is it breaks the viscosity of the liquid, and then if you taste it again, you first of all, if you smell it again, you'll suddenly see the palate's really opened up massively. 
And it's almost like when I wrote that on my hand there, you've got that big explosion of thing. And what's happened is those little drops of water have just broken the viscosity slightly on the surface, and it's allowed the aromas to really escape a bit more into the atmosphere and evaporate off. And then if I taste, it does the same thing on the palate. Mm. Now, when I taste that, that butter toffee comes before the banana chip. It really twists that palate, first palate round. And also, I'm getting more, a little bit hint of uh, maybe cassis or blackcurrant on there as well. And um, yeah, it's just delicious. And so, leave a little bit in your glass if you can. Um, and then we can come back to it later. So, you can go back to it after you taste another one and compare them against each other and see how they're different. And uh, so, yeah, that, um, so yeah, what is Shivas Regal? What about it? Uh, where does it come from? And uh, so, Shivas originally was basically, again, it was a grocer's. It was in Aberdeen at 13 King Street, if memory serves me. Um, and they were green doses. And um, it dates back to 1801. And, uh, but they didn't start producing whiskey until about 50 years later. And it was that time that we had. Uh, John and James Shivers, they basically, uh, John Shivers went there first, he started moving there, and he basically came to uh, this grocer's shop, and he basically uh, started selling the groceries there, they started blending whiskies, and it was really, these were just doing really, really well. And then basically in 1909, uh, they produced a 25 year old Shivers Regal, and they started selling that over to America, and it really took off massively, it was a big success for them, that 25 year old and it really changed their fortunes as a distiller. Um, obviously, you then had things like the Prohibition happen, and it kind of cut that legs off that. Go forward another 20, 30 years after Prohibition, you've got 90, after the war, um, Seagram's arrived, at, uh, arrived and took it over the distillery. And what they did is they basically bought the Strathyla uh, distillery as well, which is the real heart of this uh, whiskey. And, it was the first time they then produced a 12-year-old whiskey, this whiskey, and they rebranded it, and it just went nuts, uh, to the point that Frank Sinatra always had a bottle backstage, and it was his, uh, it was his backstage rider, as they called it. It was the thing that he always had to have a Manhattan, to have a drink, to have a scotch. He came on stage, he would have a scotch in his hand, and he, he would be singing away, and so that scotch was always uh, this fantastic Shivers Regal. Now, I've got a really personal story with Shivers Regal. It's like, it's the first whiskey I ever smuggled myself. <laughs> I was 12, 13 years old. I went over to um, Africa, and uh, when I was coming back, I was uh, bringing a load of goodies back for my mum and dad, and I managed to, I, just, I was 12, 11, 12 years old, don't forget. I bought a bottle of Shivers Regal, put it in my bag, and uh, it was one of these things where I, uh, got stuck at customs. It was the middle of a snowstorm coming back from Africa. I was on my own. This was at 11 or 12 and I flew back from Zimbabwe. And uh, I came back and I had a bottle of this in my bag and they opened up my bag and there was all this stuff from my parents which shouldn't have been there. And uh, then <laughs> I had this big bottle, one litre bottle of Shivers Regal on top and the lady's eyes, the uh, stewardess's eyes just sort of raised said, we won't show customs that and they shoved me through, great BA. Um, and so, yeah, it was this and I got it back and my godfather and my dad came round, uh, came round to my dad's and they drank the whole bottle there and then. And I, it was the first thing, I because I brought it back, they let me taste it. And uh, I didn't want to taste whiskey for about 10 years afterwards because I was, I was like, well, what is this stuff you're giving me at 10 years old? So yeah, so that was my first ever proper foray into a Scotch whiskey. And uh, yeah, uh, good old dad and uh, my family making me into a uh, smuggler. Um, so yeah, it kind of has hints back to that early smuggling day of Scotch whiskey as well, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, so... <clears throat> When we have this, you have like the whiskey ma magazine and you have Paul Pacolt, he basically described it as a blended whiskey for grown-ups. Um, he, he awarded it nine out of 10 in whiskey magazine and that is pretty damn impressive for a bottle of whiskey that costs 30 quid. So uh, when you consider how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds you can spend on a whiskey, I mean thousands of pounds and they don't get that same grading, it's phenomenal with that. This is one of the best, best value whiskies out there. Uh, other ones I really rate as well is Johnny Walker Green Label, really amazing blended whiskey. Um, and again with that, so this is Diageo's, uh, this is basically from Pano Ricard, and I, I have to say, I really, really do rate it. So uh, that is our first one, which is the fabulous Shiver Swedel. 
So our next whiskey we're going to go into, dive straight into, is this, Cardu, and it's the Gold Reserve. And so to no car, I've been to this distillery, I went there with uh, uh, Johnny Walker when I was up there with them about, God, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago I went up there and uh, stayed at the castle. We had a brilliant time. Uh, it was about 15 bar managers from London and it's... Yeah, there was a lot of memory loss. Uh, that's all I can say. It's a lot of whiskey, a lot of memory loss. Uh, we were at Jamir Castle, and one of the great things there, they had this billiard room there, and it was the library. And instead of books on the walls, they had every whiskey in Scotland. And you just go and help yourself, and you could never dent it. It was just too much. It was just an absolute mind blowing experience. And uh, yeah, you're in this castle in a, uh, in a library just of whiskey with a, with a billiard table trying to play billiards and pretend you're cool. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, and that whole day was spent at Cardio Distillery and I really loved it. And they are massive, they produce so much. And it's the real heart of Johnny Walker. And if you smell this, you will smell Johnny Walker all the way through it. Every, every bone they have, it has some of that in it. So. Um, where does it sit? It's in Speyside. So Speyside, we've got to go right the way up to uh, the northeast of Scotland. And so uh, if you're looking at it on the clock there, it's in that big sort of ear shape on the top of Scotland, right up the, right up the top there, uh, above Aberdeen. And um, so, yeah, it's got this, it's this little area. It's made up of about eight little villages and they all sort of make up the heart of uh, uh, Speyside and Speyside is basically runs through this where the Spey runs through and provides the water for the whiskies as well. And so, uh, the Cardu Distillery was essentially uh, it was created by a really notorious whisky smuggler, and he was called John Cumming. And uh, he founded the distillery in 1811. And uh, the Cardu Distillery it sits in uh, Moray Town, which is kind of fairly central in uh, the, uh, uh, the villages around Speyside. Um, so John, he basically licensed this distillery. He did it after the whiskey act, uh, the Excise Act in 1823. So for 12 years or so, he was a really big whiskey smuggler, and then he went legal. He went straight, and uh, and it ended his sort of uh, his his smuggling operation. And uh, so then what happened was in 1893, John Walker and Sons. Uh, they basically bought the distillery for £20,500 and uh, so they basically bought it and then in 1930 that was uh, acquired by the Distillers Company Limited and they, DCL, were massive. They were a complete conglomerate and they turned into the world's biggest drinks company, Diageo, and that's who owns it today. And so it has this real heritage of Scotland Cardu, and it's like to talk about Scotch whiskey is to talk about Cardu, and to talk about the history, the smuggling, all of it is there in that lovely story of it as well. And it's like, and the Cardu Distillery was the Johnny Walker Visitors Centre um, for many years, but that's just about to reopen in uh, Edinburgh, actually. So, uh, and that, I'm really looking forward to seeing that open. It was supposed to open this year on the 200th anniversary, but it's going to open next year now because there's some bug going around. And uh, so, yeah, that's why. So, um, so yeah, this is uh, a really, really cool whiskey, this one. So the this one here, when we get it up to our nose, so the first thing I'm gonna do is do that little, give it a shimmy shimmy, get some on my hand, rub it on, and smell it. And so what do I get? And uh, first, the next thing I'm gonna do is Little smell, little swell, another little look. We've got this lovely, rich gold, gold, gold colour. That's why it gets its name. You look at that colour on it. It's just almost like liquid gold. Some of them will be a little bit darker, a little bit more smokier coloured as well. And so this has a true golden colour to it. And um, so when I smell that, the first thing I get is apples, pears, orchard fruits, stone fruits. Uh, really hits me massively. Uh, next thing I'm getting is toffee with a hint of ginger. So that's what I'm getting on the nose there. And uh, now when I go in to actually have a taste. I get a kind of dry biscuit, almost shortbread. Almost shortbread taste. And uh, I'll get that. I will get touches of toffee and cinnamon in there as well. But the overriding flavor for me is those orchard fruits. And uh, it doesn't have the big multi flavor uh, that some will have. And it's like, that was more malty and a little bit more uh, candied that way, and a little bit more peppery smoke. 
this doesn't have the smoke at all. There's no, uh, none of that uh, smoky flavor to it. It's just silky smooth. It really opens up with the palate. I go back and I'm just gonna add in a few drops of water again to this now and give it another smell. And again, it's really led with um, apples. And so uh, in there, if you got a lovely sweetness to this one as well, which is really beautiful about it, really elegant, really easy to drink. It's a, uh, almost a, it's, it's kind of good entry level scotch because it just doesn't offend anyone, this, as far as I can see. And again, I go back to it now, now I'm getting the malt, now I'm getting a little bit of bar, that barley malt flavour. But again, it's silky, caramelly, smooth flavours and you can see when I go through these, it's about how it opens up each time with the, uh, the whiskey. So yeah, this is our Cardi Gold Reserve, I hope you like that one. Um, the, uh, as I said, Speyside, uh, where this comes from, it's that top region, it's the most densely populated whiskey region in the world. Um, there is basically in these glens and valleys, there are over 50, 60 distilleries. Um, it's absolutely jam packed full of them. You can't literally go a uh, quarter of a mile without bumping into a distillery in Speyside. And so you've got Rothers, Strathila, Lossy, Livet, Fridhorn, Dufftown, Denveron, and Speyside, uh, Deveron and Speyside Central, who are, am I missing them? That's all of them. That's all of the, uh, the, the main areas uh, that they have. It's eight defined towns of um, uh, Speyside for whiskey. So, um, but yeah, it's kind of got this kind of lovely, all of them have these kind of characteristics. This is really a, a, a supercharged version of Speyside. So it always has this kind of apple and pear flavors. They have honey, vanilla, and spice. They're really typical uh, space side. And so um, when you look at things like uh, Glenfiddich and Glenlivet Glen and Callan, all of these ones which are from space side, all of them have these beautiful characteristics in one way or another, and they are absolutely stunning. And so for me, two of the highlights are Glenlivet and uh, McCallan. They're really just beautiful. And uh, one of the whiskies I got the other week, I don't know if I've got it down here, uh, actually was this, which is Glen Livet, and it's a, it's a new one, it's Caribbean Reserve, it's in rum casks, and oh my god, that is just bonkers. Uh, where did I get that from? Tesco's, 24 quid a bottle, I mean it's down from almost £40 a bottle to 24 it's like a third off, and I highly recommend. So that is that one, if you want to get one for home, uh, not on your tasting today unfortunately, because it's me. Um, so yeah, we're going to go, so that was our Space Side Whiskey, and as you can see it, you go back to it again, and again, it's, it's just all of those flavours, that typical Space Side flavours of apple, pear, honey, vanilla, and a little bit of spice, and it typifies it in every way. Um, the next one we're going to go on to is uh, a Lowland uh, Whiskey, and so these are um, uh, here, and this is this one, which is Ocken Toshen. And uh, yes, it's a bit of a mouthful, and uh, you kind of need to be Scottish to say it properly. Um, so if all of my Scottish friends and family, and I'm saying that wrong, I am in trouble. And this is a slightly unusual version, it is my favorite one of this is actually their Triple Wood, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, but this is a new one. I hadn't tasted it before, so that was why I kind of wanted to do it, so I could really experience it. And I've tried their 18 year old, which is just bonkersly nuts. Uh, and then they've got their Triple Wood, which is just, Delicious, highly recommend it. Um, but this one, the reason why I like Ockentoshan and I chose them is they are up triple distilled. And uh, so for me, it's quite unusual in the fact that uh, you don't usually get that. And it gives a smoothness to uh, this whiskey as well. And so it's one of the very few triple distilled uh, single malts in Scotland. As you know, most of them are uh, double distilled in pot stills. This is triple distilled. And it just has that extra level of distillation, gives it a little bit roundness and smoothness that is and silky flavor to it, which is uh, kind of delicious. So I'm just gonna go into this one again. I'm gonna, first of all, give it a little look. And again, it's got a, if I compare it to that super gold color of the first, of the um, Cardu, um, it's coming in a tiny bit darker and a little bit on the brownier side, grassier side. And uh, there's a little bit of yellowiness in there, greeniness in there, which is that kind of grassiest, uh, of kind of notes. So that gives us an idea of where these Lowland whiskies really do come from. And so 
uh, when I look at a lowland distillery, I'm kind of going uh, grassy notes is one of the big kind of uh, flavors I will go for. There will also be honeysuckle. It's floral. It's got toast and cinnamon and lemonade and uh, a bit of toffee, a bit of cream, and that kind of thing. So it's it's it's, it's very. Uh, they're called the lowland ladies, uh, the lowland ones, because they are much more lighter and floral. They're a lot more softer. They they call them feminine, but you can't really call whiskey feminine or masculine, or whatever. It's like uh, we're going away from those sexist days in whiskey. It's like whiskey is whiskey. One of the great things about whiskey is a lot of the distillers out there now, and the head distillers, especially a place like Johnny Walker and McCallum, and all these distilleries all over Scotland are women and people don't really know this they always assume it's some old bast old old bloke that's <laughs> almost said old bastard but yeah old old bloke in a distillery sniffing away to deciding what to do there are young glamorous ladies older ladies all sorts in distilleries being master distillers and controlling the whiskey market without us knowing it they've grown up with it their whole lives and families and everything they've taken over distilleries and they are the leaders in the field. And uh, so to say whiskey is a man's drink is a load of bull. And that's that. And uh, that's all I'm going to say on it. Uh, but the other thing that is quite good on it is that women do have quite a really well developed sense of palette. It's why when a woman looks at colour, they will describe it in a thousand different colours and blokes will go blue. And uh, it's the same logic. And uh, so, yeah, we can do the same with flavour. And so these flavour profiles really do a pop on the palate. So when we look at our little map here, you'll see it's all at the top end here of our little wheel underneath it. And so you've got fruity, floral, sweetness, all those things I said, honey, nutty, and malty. And it's like, that is really where our lowland whiskies comes in. And uh, with these, when we look at it, um, we've got to go with Ockentosh. And the thing about it is that it, really is just in those lowlands. It's in Glasgow and it's on uh, and uh, so you see the distillery there and you drive past it while I'm going up to Sky to see my brother-in-law and uh, I kind of love it for that as well. And it's like so it started life under the name of Dontosha and this was first mentioned in about 1834 and then they renamed it Okantosha and it basically comes from a Gaelic word which is Akad Oisin and I probably completely ruined that and I'll get my uh, niece up in Scotland who is, speaks fluent Gaelic will crucify me next time I go up. And it basically means corner of the field. And uh, so geographically it lies just in the lowlands. And the lowlands basically is everything from Glasgow down, really. It's like, uh, it's that whole bit, the borderlands uh, uh, all the way up to Glasgow. And so it's that all of those lowlands, you, as soon as you start going up, uh, into the highlands and you start going up past Loch Lomond and the Trossachs, uh, you'll start hitting uh, essentially uh, the Highland whiskies then, which is the next one after uh, this as well. So when I'm coming here, it's like <coughs> this was kind of bombed in the Second, uh, Second World War and the Clyde Banks shipyards were bombed to hell. And so in 1948, after the war, they basically reconstructed the distillery and they gave it its new name, Ockentosh. And so, as I said, they do a three barrel one where it's done in three different barrels aged. Um, and you've got an Oloroso uh, and a Pedro uh, Jimenez Sherry. And then you've also got a bourbon cask as well. So uh, it's, it's got a really rich flavor that one. The PX Sherry on it just is really good. So I highly recommend going to search that out as another one to look at. I chose this one because I hadn't tasted it and I really wanted to. Uh, curiosity got the best of me as always uh, on a lot of these things. It's like the Cardi one as soon as I saw that. I got to have it uh, just because I've been to the distillery and I hadn't tried that whiskey before. So uh, a lot of these whiskies I'm trying for the first time as well when I'm uh, having them because they're fairly new and that's why uh, um, they're quite fresh expressions as well. I try to choose whiskies that aren't too overpowering for you. Uh, so yeah, so let's get back to our American wood. So this is basically done in bourbon casks, this one. And so they've aged it in American uh, bourbon whiskey barrels that have been repurposed. And so you'll get a bit of that Americanness coming over, that bourbon flavor coming over. Um, so again, I'm just gonna give it a little shake on my hand and then I'm just gonna do that. Let the alcohol burn off a bit and come back in. And so I'm kind of getting a little bit of, oh, I've got hay. That's that's the thing really with, and this is what I'm looking for. I loved, I'm really glad I found that in a uh, in the American barrel version. 
because it smells like almost wet hay. And uh, stuff when you've got horses and you put out the hay is that wet hay that, and it's really strong. And uh, I really love that about it. And then I've got chocolate and toffee, and I've got some citrus and orange, uh, orange and lemon. Yeah, sort of like a uh, St. Clemens. And so I've got those all coming through, but the really overpowering one for this is grassy air. It's that tossed hay uh, kind of thing. And that is absolutely typical of a lowland Scotch whiskey. And uh, so when I go in for a taste, as you can see, that's really smooth on the palate. And then at the end of the palate, finish on it, it builds. And so you have a soft, almost tropical flavor, chocolate and coconut, bounty bars, that kind of thing, citrus and peaches. Um, and, there's, and then it builds into a bit of spice and you get this kind of dryness on the back of the palate. That's, that's the oak talking, that's the bourbon oak talking there. And it's that dry oak on the back of the palate that really sings. And then your last thing, tip of the tongue is like eating a, uh, a toffee, that's the way I describe it. I've got that on the thing, Weather's Original on the, uh, on the tongue there as well. And so, uh, yeah, it's, that's delicious, I have to say. I'm really, really pleased that. That toffee really comes through at the end. And that is from the bourbon barrel, through and through. That is bourbon all the way. And so that's, it's, 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 it's a real dichotomy, that, because it really has that, you smell that, and I've still got a big grassy smell. And then I'm just going to put it in a little bit of water again on that and just see how it opens it up. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you get that grass on that. It's just, oh my God. It's like, it literally like, it's like summer hay for me. Um, yeah, beautiful. Um, so yeah, so that is a lowland whiskey. So as I said, they're all below uh, Glasgow. So the opposite of the lowlands, obviously the highlands. And so the highlands is the biggest region of Scotland uh, when it comes to whiskey production. And so uh, the one we've got here is we're using the Ardmore, like this. And this is a colossal size distillery. It is absolutely bonkersly big up on the Highlands. Again, I've been to it as well. Um, I came actually back coming from the Cardi distillery, stopped off there. It's vast. I've never seen a distillery like it. And uh, it's now owned by Bean Global, which is a big and Suntory. And so they are massive. And uh, obviously there you've got a golden eagle on the bottle. It, denotes the Highlands, it's one of the symbols of the Highlands. Uh, I looked everywhere for one when I was up there in the su uh, late summer, I couldn't see one. Uh, saw a lot of buzzards, uh, a couple of kestrels and kites and stuff, but no golden eagles unfortunately. But um, it was built originally by a certain Adam teacher, and that gives you a clue where most of that whiskey went and thing. And he established the distillery and it basically for his teachers blended whiskey. And so it became the heart of teachers. And so uh, it now, it sold for, I don't know, 2005, 2006 to Beam Suntory, uh, Beam Global, and uh, it was $5 billion it sold for. So that's how big a chunk of the whiskey industry, how big that whiskey distillery is. It was just absolutely bonkersly large. And uh, so for this one, what we've got, and I'm just going to lift it out, um, we start coming into the smoky palette. And so when we go up to the Highlands, we start uh, having this peated, a uh, bit of peated whiskey coming into things as well. And so, uh, as I said, it's one of the largest distilleries in Scotland here. And the Ardmore is also got an amazing scientific research laboratory. And it's where they do loads of research into how to make uh, scotch better, how to improve it, how to create different flame profiles, all those different things happening there as well. Um, I haven't been to that lab and I really would. That's one of my want to go places in the whiskey maps of Scotland. So hoping to get up there. Um, this is called the Ard uh, Ardmore Legacy, and so uh, again, it's a non-age statement uh, whisky. So it's over three years, but it's probably going to be about five, six, seven years, something like that. Eight years, I would almost imagine with that. Um, and so uh, when we look at this, is the Ardmore whiskies? They are basically uh, generally very quite peaty lead, and so uh, what they do is they, as I said before, they roast those malts on peat and they smoke up through it, and it takes a lot of that flavor through and then when they distill it a lot of that flavor comes through to the bottle and it just sings in it 
And so this is about an 80% peated and 20% unpeated malt on this. So uh, yeah, let's go in and have a quick taste then. You can start seeing on the little flavor map here, on this profile, everything's kind of in the middle where the, the other three whiskies, everything's kind of to the top of those things in the sweetness side of things. This is now coming in the middle, it's kind of drier. And it's also becoming, uh, there's more body and more smokiness. So you start seeing the spikes hit the smoky notes on that. And that's that peat. Um, so I go in that straight away. Suddenly the, uh, the nose on it is completely and utterly different. Yeah, completely bonkersly different to any of the other three whiskies we've tried now. And so uh, I'm going to give that another little jiggle and uh, rub my hands. And some of you won't want to waste your whiskey this way, but it really is a really great way of just expressing how to get all of those aromas, because instead of just having that tiny bit on there, you're letting that evaporate off your hand, and the temperature of your hand really makes it evaporate quickly. And you'll really get so many more of those notes in there. So now I'm getting a real sort of summer barbecue, earthy, sort of like wetter, like that, you know, when rain hits the earth and it's just wet, and you get that ozone kind of flavor to it. And honey with, uh, Toffee and vanilla, yeah, and it's just like, uh, and then I go back to it, and it's like a little barbecue, I love it. Um, uh, yeah, really, really nice. So when I go in now for the taste, yeah, it's, you get the smoke straight away, you get a bit of oak, and there's almost that, if everyone's had uh, pear drop sweets as a kid, you'll kind of get a little bit of that flavor in there. And uh, it's kind of that flavor I'm kind of getting quite a bit at the moment. And uh, uh, almost that acid pear kind of thing, yeah, you know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna go back again and just add in a few drops of water again to this. Yeah, it's really opened up the smoke again even more. And it's like, what we're getting now is like, when I get that on the last bit of the palette, I'm getting this kind of honeyed, uh, sort of barley or uh, butterscotch kind of thing. It's like with a bit of smoke added to it. Yeah, the malt really comes through now. Yeah, and uh, so I'm going to put that in front of me again. Now, as I said, go back and try another one. Go back to your cardi. Taste the cardi now. Smell the cardi now. Compared to that one, you go the card move, cardi and the Ardor, you could not get more apart as it comes in with that. One, you really, the apples come out of that even more now when you've tried that. If you try to taste even more, you'll get the flavors popping out. The, the disparities between flavor really start changing as you go along with these whiskies. And this is one of the things with whiskey tasting is really good. It's like going through them, as you go back, you compare, you compare, you can go back and forwards. And it shouldn't just be a one directional thing. You should go back again and try the blended whiskey to see how that tastes and um, this is a great way to enjoy whiskey and it's like when we can get all social again with this it's a great way to do it socially with friends as well and you'll find something that really does appeal to you and uh, become something that you can call your own as well um, so yeah that's the Ardmore um, I hope you like that one uh, the next one we're going to is Glen Scotia and uh, so my Glen Scotia here now <coughs> This used to be one of the biggest regions of uh, whiskey production in Scotland. And it's a tiny little peninsula and it's basically called Campbelltown. And uh, they used to have 30 distilleries there. So when you consider that Speyside had about 50 odd distilleries, 30 distilleries in one little peninsula. And it's completely unspoiled. And uh, it has an amazing, amazing whiskey production heritage. It now only has three distilleries. And this kind of happened because of prohibition. Remember I said at the beginning about how prohibition really affected Scottish whiskey production. No other region other than Campbelldown got decimated as much by prohibition because of it. And now we kind of had three distilleries. And Glen Scotia is possibly the most successful of them. Um, you have Spring, Springbank, which is insane, but insanely expensive. You're talking 300 pound a bottle starting up to five, six, seven, 800 pound bottle just skyrockets. Um, and then you've got Glengal as well, which is the other one. So there's three of them as well. And so this was uh, founded in 1832 uh, by uh, Stuart Galbraith and co. And so they basically set up in the north of the town. It's the distillery that's still there. Um, and it's one of three. And 
Uh, this one here, again, it's a new expression. It's called Camel Town Harbour. And uh, I've been particularly interested to try this again. It's quite a younger variation again of it. And uh, Campbell Town, as I said, was kind of the uh, the capital of Scotch whisky production up until Prohibition, and then it just got completely ruined by it. And uh, it didn't come out surviving on it. And so when I come into this one, I'm going to give it my little shake again. Now, Campbell Town, it's by the sea. And so what I'll get here, and they are lightly peated here. They're not the big peats that we expect from uh, Islay, which we'll be doing last, but they're lightly peated. So, you, but the thing is, it's that seaness that comes into it. And I get a kind of salty flamed heather with a uh, sea spray and almost seaweedy, that kind of iodine flavor from seaweed. And that really shines through all this. It really does come through. And it's like, um, I go in for the taste and straight away, pop. It's herby, briny, salty almost. It's got quite a floral note to it. It's really complex. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's almost nuts. It's like completely not what I expect from the nose on this one. And, uh, but you've kind of got a biscuity, apple-y flavour to the kind of apple crumble. And uh, so, yeah, that is, uh, but then I'm getting a kind of a sweet caramelised flavour at the end of it as well. So, and it's, it's just, it's well balanced, you know, I really, actually, I really rate that. It's a lovely, lovely whiskey just to drink. I'm just going to put in tiny bit of water and see how that opens it up again. Now again, most of these whiskies that we're doing here are all around 40%, so they're pretty accessible. When you start getting cask strength, they're really stupidly strong, and so adding the water is even more important, because um, that amount of alcohol just rips your palate apart and can be quite harsh on your palate. So when we're looking at this now, you've got, ah, you can see on my map here, you've got a lovely sweetness spike, but then you're coming down to this almost medicinal, that's that iodine, that salty briny flavor that I said there. You know, it comes right over on the smoke and the body there, but you've still got that multi heart. And uh, so yeah, all of those flavors which I just described there, they're, they're bang there. Can't even see it because I've got a glass in the way, but um, yeah, they're all there in, in droves. And uh, so yeah, this is kind of the typification of a Campbell Town uh, sort of um, whiskey. And as I said before, it's quite often overlooked. It's such a tiny little peninsula, like a little finger off the side of uh, Scotland. And um, you, you blink and you miss it. And you don't realize how important it is as Scotch uh, whiskey sort of thing. Now, the other thing that we're looking at when we go back to our, now I go back to this, my Ardmore again. And I have a little smell of that. And it's again, that peat monster, come, that peat comes through that much more again. And that smokiness as well. And so those really, it kind of rolls on a bit more. Now, when I look at those uh, highland areas as well, we've also got to look at the islands. So the islands aren't to be confused with our next one, which is Islay. And uh, islands are places like Talisca. So if I come up here and I've got this beauty, which is Talisca Scorn, which I got from the distillery up there uh, at the end of the summer, and it's pretty nuts. And we did a cast tasting. Now, this is up at 45.8%, uh, so it's, it's a lot stronger. But we were tasting whiskey straight out of the barrel at almost 65, 67, 8, 70%, and they were absolutely off the charts. And you really need a little bit of water in there to open them up even more. But they were straight out of the cask and they were beautiful. And uh, But that has a big smoky note to it as well. But the islands are quite often seen as part of the highlands. And so when you look at that, it says uh, it's a highland whiskey. And it says that on it. When you have something that is uh, like Highland Park, it's clues in the name. And uh, that's on Orkney. And so uh, you kind of, it's on one of those islands all around the top end of Scotland. They're seen as the, they're called islands, but they are highlands as well. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but that's, that's the one difference there, which we haven't tasted today, but it kind of is encompassed in that Ardmore again. The last whiskey we're moving on to today is our Bowmore 12 year old single malt scotch. And this is from Isle. Now, when you actually look at this and you look at your, if you pick up the top 
two like that, and you look at your Ardmore, your Glen Scotia, and your uh, Bowmore, the one thing you'll notice about this one is that the spike on Smoky is a bit bigger. Now, if that was Lagavulin, the spike would be coming down even more. And that's another of the Ile ones. Now, Ile is typified by being a, uh, the home of peat smoked whiskies. It's where the peat monsters are. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's on the Inner Hebrides, so it's southernmost island, most southernmost island of the Inner Hebrides, but it's no less rugged. It's completely barren and swept and isolated in parts. And it's, uh, but it's like, these ones have a real salinity and smoky peating, peatiness to it. They're complex in the extreme. They have layer after layer after layer after layer. And uh, so this one we've got here is our Beaumont 12 year old. And so um, when we taste this in a second, this is, the, this is not even close to the biggest monster out there, which is Lafroig. So you have Lafroig uh, or Lagavulins, and they are big, big monsters when it comes to flavour and peat, and they blow your head off. One of the biggest problems Scotch has had to overcome over the years is that the first whisky some people start and try is those whiskies because it's the ones that are there and uh, their granddad gives it a little nip of it and they're like oh, I don't want to taste that ever again and they have they're forever thought that's all that whiskey tastes like and you can see here you've got these lovely sweetness and soft floral ones of the lowlands you've got these apple orchards of Speyside and you've got these almost light complexity smokiness and then you've got the saltiness and uh, you've got the grassiness of the lowlands you've got this smokiness coming into it in the highlands you've got the uh, the salty seaweediness coming in in that uh, Campbelltown. As we get to Isle, everything's on steroids. And uh, so we're going to attack this one next. And this is our last one of the night for this before we hit that last cocktail. So I'm going to put my nose in. And straight away, I'm hit by big peat smoke. And uh, that's at the heart of it, really. And uh, I get that. The other thing I'm getting at is, if you think about Earl Grey tea, one of the big things in Earl Grey tea, and it's a flavour I absolutely love in everything apart from Earl Grey tea, is bergamot. But it's really weird. I can't drink Earl Grey tea because I just think like, it smells like grannies. But when I smell bergamot on its own, that orange bergamot, I love it. Uh, I'm using cocktails a lot. We've got it in quite a few of our new cocktails uh, in our um, corporate box coming out at the moment. And, uh, yeah, I just really love it. And um, I get hay, I get floral, but it's just smoky, smoky, smokiness. And uh, so I'm gonna go and put a taste. Now that flavor profile doesn't fit anything we've had before. We have oily, dark smoke, dark peat. It's really weights on the palate. You just really, it's a sort of, almost like an oil slick across your tongue. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. <laughs> Love that. Um, and it's just, it just hangs there as well. So you get this kind of layer on your palate, on your tongue, but I'm getting some of that dry grass hay with it as well, but it's just smoky and that length of palate on the smokiness just lingers and lingers and lingers. It's, it's one of the more, Bowmore 12 is one of the more accessible um, kind of Islay scotches. It's middle of the range and uh, it kind of sits there and it's it's in the harbour town of Bowlaw, Bowmore, which is Islay's capital. And um, so it's right at the heart of the Islay whiskies and their traditions. It's got some of the most strict adherence to the Islay traditions and how they make their whiskey. And uh, it's Islay's oldest distillery as well. So it just really is, it's the heart of an Islay. Um, and I've not been there, I've not been to Islay yet. It's on my list of things to do. Um, next time I'm up there, I'm gonna try and get out to a few of the islands like Jura and uh, particularly Islay and just um, do visit a couple, of, uh, a couple of these places as well. Um, and it's kind of a middle ground. Um, it's 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 an unoffensive Isle, and it's like. But the thing is, if I'd gone straight in with that, I can guarantee half the people would have been like, "Wow, what the hell?" Like that. But we've worked our way up through the palate on that, and now you'll see this is a whiskey that's easy to drink. And I'm just going to now pop in a little bit of water to that, and just again, 
it's it's the whole pallet journey is built me up to this. I I can never really go straight in with an IA whiskey. Uh, first off, I've got to build myself and work myself up to it, and this isn't allowed me to do that. And I hope it's done the same with you. Now I'm getting even more briny, seaweedy, salinity to that, and the smokiness is just terrific. So yeah, um, that is the whiskey tasting. We still have another cocktail to make. So uh, what I'm going to do now is we are. I'm going to get my glass back just so I can show you how to garnish that, and uh, then you can go off. You can garnish your glass, and we're going to have a little brief musical interlude and uh, uh, the song, uh, I hope you really like it, is, 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 is sung beautifully by my brother in law. Um, but before we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to uh, my grater, that shortbread. Hopefully you haven't eaten it yet. Um, I know that one of my closest friends, uh, Luciana Hall, has probably scoffed a lot. And, uh, or she's, the dog's eating it, Bibi. So um, a friend of mine's doing this today, and. Um, we have, I have a god dog. Uh, we kind of conspired to buy this sausage dog behind my wife's back and behind her husband's back. And so what happened was uh, John, her husband, basically said she couldn't have a dog because she had to be at school all day teaching and who was going to look after the dog. And I ran bars, so I worked at nights. And my wife said I can't have a dog because I work at nights. Who, who's going to look after the dogs at nights when we're working? And so uh, we conspired and we said, actually, wait a second, this is a perfect thing. We lived opposite each other in London. And uh, so we got the dog and uh, Bibi, little sausage dog, absolutely adorable, big floppy ears, complete nutter. Um, she's still got the dog. Um, I moved down here and she kept the dog and she took the dog overseas and I want my dog. Um, so Luciana Caterina, give me my effing dog back. Um, anyhow, uh, Bibi, bite her. Um, so anyhow, what I want you to do is take some shortbread and I just want you to, I'm just going to grate this up and I've taken my glass that we got earlier and I've taken it out of the freezer and you can see it's just starting to defrost slightly and as it defrosts you're going to get a little bit of condensation all on the outside of that and that condensation is going to allow me to coat this glass, hopefully, with this finely grated or finely ground uh, shortbread. And so the easiest way to do this is, when you're doing it, is to pour it over glass. So I'm just grating that all up. And I'm really hoping BB is attacking Luciano at the moment. Um, another thing we've got up here as well is, uh, Dan James is getting married. Aha, good luck, mate. Uh, I don't know when he's getting married, but sometime after lockdown, all this rubbish is finished. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take my uh, bit there. So congratulations, Dan. Um, I don't do shout outs per se, usually. And part of the reason is I'll just be doing them all the time. But you know what? Anyone who's brave enough to get married in lockdown deserves my full respect. Um, and so, yeah, good on you, mate. And uh, good luck. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's got his whole stag do online with this whiskey glass. So I'm just going to go around that a little bit more and tap it off. And a little bit more, just back in again. And just, this gets a bit messy. You can go backwards and forwards with it as it melts down. And then just shake it off. And you'll get what's called a cruster. And so if I hold that up now, you can see it's completely coated in shortbread. Keep that shortbread because we're going to sprinkle that on the top of the cocktail in a minute. So while that just sits there, and while you all catch up, uh, I'm going to taste a bit more whiskey. We're going to listen to some great music by my brother-in-law. And so, yeah, enjoy. And, uh, yeah, we will...
whistling winds and slaughtering guns bring autumn's pleasant weather. The moorcock springs on whirring wings among the blooming heather. Now waving green, wild o'er the plain. Delights a wee farmer The moon shines bright As I rove at night To muse upon my charmer The partridge loves The fruited fells The plover loves the night The woodcock haunts the lonely dells, the soaring hern, the fountain. Through lofty groves, the cushrack rolls, the path of man to shine in it. The hazel bush, or hangs a thrush, the spreading thorn. Thus every kind of pleasure find The savage and the tender Some social join and leagues combine Some solitary wonder I want to the cruel sweet Tyrannic man's dominion, the sportsman's joy, the murdering cry, the fluttering gory pinion. So Peggy dear, the evening's clear Pick flies the skimming swallow The sky is blue with fields and view All fading green and yellow Come let us dream our gladsome way And view the child of nature, the fruited thorn, the rustling corn, and every happy creature. We'll gently walk and sweetly talk till the silent moon shines clear. I'll grasp thy waist and fondly pressed Swear how I love thee dearly Not fair no showers to bobbing flowers Not autumn to the farmer As dear can be as thou to me my fair and lovely charmer Hi, welcome back. Uh, we thank you very much, Donnie, for that. Uh, so 
yeah, that was uh, the last bit of music. We're coming back to our last cocktail now. And so I've overrun a little bit, but I hope you've enjoyed the whiskey tasting. It took a little bit longer than I originally advertised. Um, but yeah, we with this, you should have your shortbread now. You can either eat that, the spare piece you can eat or feed to BB um, or uh, yeah, just still husbands, whatever. It's like that. So you should have a nice glass that is coated with your uh, cruster of that. And what we're going to need for this is a cocktail shaker. I'm going to ask for some ice, and uh, that's going to come through in a second for me. And what we need for this is we'll need our second two bottles here. So the two unmarked bottles are going to be the ones we need for this. And what I'm going to do is I've just got coming in there uh, some fresh ice and Basically, this is a shaken cocktail, so if you've got a cocktail shaker, if you haven't got a cocktail shaker, don't worry. Um, what we're going to do is shake this up, but it's an egg cocktail. And uh, so egg and cocktails, I've got some great fresh local organic eggs. And uh, the nice thing about this is it gives a lovely silky creaminess to it. And uh, it's particularly lovely. Uh, the whiskies I'm going to be using for this are actually... Uh, these two here, and so we've got a Speyside single malt, which is Glenfiddich in there, um, and so this is Glenfiddich 12 year old, it's one of the, it's the world's biggest selling single malt whiskey. Um, they claim it was the world's first single malt whiskey, um, that probably deserves to be Glenlivet, to be honest, and uh, although they said they invented it in the 1950s and 60s, uh, however, in their own website they have a bottle from 1907 or something like that. So their own website disputes what they're saying on their thing. So we're going to go away from that being the world's oldest single malt. Um, what what does happen though is that they are they have some of the oldest barrels of it. So some of the most expensive single malts in the world are their 50 year old, their 60 year old, and things like that. And they go for tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Um, the other whiskey we have in there is this one and. Uh, this is made in Girvan. Uh, it's made by Glenn Grant, uh, William Grant and Sons. And uh, so they basically uh, created this out of three single malts. Uh, so it's a blended whiskey. It's got a real bourbon characteristic to it. But uh, the thing I love about that, it's, in, it's from Girvan. And Girvan is proper lowlands. So it's almost, it's way, way down south of. Uh, the actual uh, Glasgow even. So that's a real lowland uh, distillery where it's produced. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna crack my egg whole into that. And so we're gonna pop that in. Um, I've got some ice in there. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in bottles number one and two. And so in here I've got a blend of, if I smell that, I really get the two malts that I've got in there. And uh, the lovely thing about this is that I've kind of used, uh, they're both by William Grant Sons, these whiskies. And uh, again, they're kind of things I really, really like. Uh, and the other ingredient I've got in there, you'll get there's a really big chocolate nose on this as well. So what we've essentially got in there is 25 milliliters of that monkey shoulder whiskey. I then have a uh, 10 milliliters of the so 25 mils of that, 10 mils of Glenfiddich, uh, 12 year old. Uh, the next ingredient I've got in there is this, which is Briatect, and it is creme de cacao, chocolate liqueur. So I'm, what I'm doing is layering up these chocolate flavors. Uh, then what we've got is a salted caramel syrup, which is in that other little unmarked uh, small bottle. So I'm just gonna pop that in as well. And so we've got the sweetness from the liqueur, we've got a little bit of caramel in there as well. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna give that a shake for about, I don't know, 15 to 20 seconds, mix all the ingredients. So when we open that up, you'll get almost a nice, it almost looks like um, the yellowy cream color to it, which is just delicious. So I'm just gonna strain that into there. And the color of the egg gets is almost golden in there. So I'm just gonna pour that in to my glass. 
And so, as we see there, we've got this lovely shortbread all along there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a bit of my shortbread powder here that I've grated up. I'm going to sprinkle him along the top, just in a line along the top, as a kind of garnish on the top of this drink. And so, when we actually drink this, it's it's got this lovely sort of salt, little bit of salty brininess to it from the salted caramel. Um, mm. The nose is all shortbread now, so all I can think I'm going to get is this lovely shortbread. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is silky, smooth, deliciousness. And flips are a great old cocktail. I've gone into them before, we did a whole thing on flips and fizzes way back at the beginning of the first lockdown. Um, the egg in this, don't be afraid of using a whole fresh egg, just use fresh, fresh eggs. Uh, these ones I brought this morning and so they are fresh as and don't be afraid of that. This is utterly, utterly delicious. It's indulgent, it's voluptuous and sexy and just really deliciousness personified. So yeah, I hope you like that uh, second cocktail. I hope you've learned something of the whiskey tasting. I hope you're not afraid of whiskey anymore. Um, this is the first of many tastings we're gonna be doing. Um, we have another one coming up at the end of the uh, month and uh, in next month which is going to be a gin one where we'll be doing a whole history of gin but tasting through the through the decades through the millennia uh, not millennia uh, through the centuries so we'll start with the ancient originations of gin all the way up to very modern gins and flavored gins and so we'll give you a whole tutored tasting of that with a couple of amazing tutored uh, gin cocktails as well that we've created for stir crazy as well um, so that's coming up um, the next masterclass we've got coming up is on the 6th and it is the Acid House and it's Acid and uh, we are going into the acidification of cocktails, all the different acids that you do with it. So we've got malic, tartaric, uh, citric, uh, acetic and what else am I missing? I'm sure I'm missing something. Lactic. So yeah, so we've got all of them covered in, that, in those cocktails and so We'll be talking about how we sour a cocktail, and there's a four drink box, £20 online. Um, it'll be going up online uh, as soon as, it, probably not uh, today actually, on Saturday it'll be up. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's well worth having a look at for that one as well. And then we've got a load of other things coming up as well. We've got a Valentine's box coming up as well, which will be really good. We're talking about aphrodisiacs and cocktails. So that's a great thing to look at as well. If you want something to do on lockdown uh, Valentine's Day, um, yeah, we, it's, 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 we've got a lot going on with it, so watch the space, look at the website, follow our social media. Um, thank you for taking part tonight. Uh, really massive thank you to Donald Livingston for both songs and also to my lovely wife Dee Livingston for doing the Ode to the Haggis earlier. Happy Burns Night, everyone. Enjoy uh, the rest of what's left of January.